record on this computer. Hi, my name is Renee Habs. Welcome to COM 416 at the spring semester here at the University of Rhode Island. And today's date is Tuesday, February 19th. I'm here with uh, two Jessicas, Olivia, Hannah, Pam, and um, we're talking disinformation and propaganda tonight. So, um, as I uh, as I as I told you a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Florence, Italy, uh, last week uh, for a conference on disinformation sponsored by the European Commission. You know, this spring, the, every five years, who knew? Every five years, the European uh, Union has votes for the European Parliament. And that means every citizen in all 28 member states of Europe uh, casts a ballot for uh, a member of parliament who will go to the, you know, the United States of Europe, if you think of it that way, right? The, the EU in uh, Brussels and make decisions on all kinds of policies, fiscal policy and trade policy and consumer protection policy. And... Um, the uh, European Commission is kind of worried that disinformation is going to mm, mess up that election. So it was a really interesting uh, day of uh, discussion with experts from computer science and public policy and government and media literacy. And uh, we talked about um, what the challenges were. It was kind of comforting to see that the Europeans are having the same concerns that we are. <laughs> but at the same time, it's kind of scary, right? This is a global phenomenon, right? And they're, the French are worried that the, ele the European parliamentary elections are gonna be screwed up and the Italians and the Dutch are worried and the Croatians and the Germans. So, ay, 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 ay. It's just fascinating to see um, how the nature of the way we think about election and politics is uh, really being changed by disinformation. So um, let me share my screen with you because we have so much to talk about. I want to get right to it. Um, so here I am at the, give me a thumbs up if you can see the page now. I'm not exactly sure. Can you see the page now? Okay, good show. So um, here's what I want to do first. Uh, in light of our um, theme for tonight, um, Let's start by watching a short video on the topic of recognizing disinformation. And then I'm gonna ask each of you to um, pick one of these seven um, ideas. Um, Olivia, how about if you take um, the author, number one, right? Your, your job is gonna to be to kind of think about who is the author. Uh, and maybe also thinking about the, um, yeah, actually, Pam, I'm going to have you think about the target audience. How's that? Right? Mm -hmm. Hannah, can you consider this question as you're watching? What's the purpose of this video? Is it to inform, to entertain, or to persuade? Uh, and uh, Jessica Ouellette, how about if you take the number five content? Which advice is most helpful and why? They're going to give us five pieces of advice. As you watch this video, I kind of want to get your impression about what, uh, what content is most helpful. Um, okay, and Jessica, the other Jessica, I'm going to have you do the techniques question. How is this video constructed to attract and hold attention? So as you watch, you're going to be thinking about, like, what are they doing to put it together to make it interesting. And then we'll all together think about this important question. What is missing, right? Uh, anybody have any questions about what we're gonna do? We're gonna watch this five minute video, then we're gonna talk about it kind of in relation to some of these issues. Give me a thumbs up if you know what we're doing next. You got it? Yeah, I see thumbs up. So I think you're clear on the task. Uh, we'll just watch it through the computer right here. I'll sort of mm, move my stuff over so we can all see it and turn up my microphone. Let's take a look. Disinformation. Though its sudden appearance on your newsfeed may seem like it's a new phenomenon, it's actually been used to influence 
people for centuries. What separates today from disinformation tactics of the past is the speed and volume of information that travels. Amplified by social media, disinformation can spread misleading data, false claims, and outright lies. These tactics can reduce public trust and endanger democracy. While the most outrageous headlines may be entertaining and easy to spot, it's often the most convincing stories that are the most deceptive and spread the furthest. But recognizing disinformation is not always as straightforward as you think. The more realistic the story seems, the quicker false information can spread. The first step in stopping the spread of disinformation is recognizing it and its real impacts. Disinformation circulates in a variety of forms, but there are ways to spot it. Here are five tips to analyze and validate news and information. Number one, identify the sources. Does the publication even exist? Is there an author? Be cautious of no bylines and strange URLs, like those ending in .com, .co, and slight variations on common news websites. Number two, look beyond the headline. Grammar errors, made up names, and inflammatory claims are telltale signs of unsavory sources and unvalidated news. Number three, recognize satire. Some publications explicitly state that they post satirical content. Others are less obvious. Look for indications that their content is meant to be humorous rather than misleading. Number four, where does the story get its support? Does the article link to or reference any research? Frequently using the words research says without disclosing it is a major red flag. Number five, consider your own bias. It's possible you feel strongly about an article or headline because it confirms your own opinions. Do your best to consider the facts objectively. This information is constantly evolving and often difficult to detect. Be vigilant, and next time you scroll your newsfeed, remember these tips and do your own digging. Okay, so um, who wants to go first? What thoughts do you have about this short video? I'll go first. Thanks. So um, I was supposed to address the author, um, and the author is important because it speaks a lot to like knowledge base and like whether or not they're like the right person to be talking about a subject or if they're a reliable source, especially with like fake news and stuff. Yeah, so who was the author of this piece? Could it was, know? well, it was like something about America, I said. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, it was our federal government, right? It was the US State Department, right? And that's the part of government that deals with foreign countries, right? The ambassadors and all of that. All right, who's next? What do you have to say about this video? Uh, this is Hannah, hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, I had the question whether or not it was to persuade, entertain, or inform, and I would say it was definitely to inform um just like following the few tips trying to figure out when you're going through social media or anything trying to see any disinformation or just like ideas on um how to like look out for it and you can also like give these ideas to, like your family or friends too because i know my mom is like constantly like clicking on things and she'll text me and she'll be like oh did you see this I'm, like that's not true like you can totally tell so it definitely is in uh to inform people about it <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So, you, so you, for you, the uh, quality of inform was on the the practical advice. That yes. Was given. Yeah. Yep. That practical advice seemed pretty, uh, pretty uh, solid. Uh, okay. Let me hear from somebody else. What's your analysis and interpretation of this video? Well, um, I had number five, and it was what advice did I think was the most important and why. And I thought that number four, the facts and support was really important because if there's no like hard, solid facts, then you can't really take it as factual or you can't share it because then it would be considered propaganda. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Got it. So for you, the evidence, uh, it said beware of uh, research that yeah. reports that say research says yeah. without linking 
to the actual research, right? So it wanted you, it wanted you to be on the lookout for being providing real details. Okay, great. Who's next? What do you have to say about the uh, video? Um, I had number six about the techniques, and I think that the video was done really well, especially all videos that are done like this. Um, reminds me of like what you're taught in a communication major, just to use a lot of graphics and images, and then the text that was shown is just information that they want to highlight or examples of news headings, um, but really didn't have a lot of text, and the graphics kind of moved you through the points, and so... Um, it keeps, I think, the viewer a lot more entertained and able to be receptive of the information. Yes, I noticed that the uh, technique was a, f a very simple form of animation, right? Mm -hmm. Very simple animation. Uh, and one of the reasons why I knew uh, a, a little bit about the target audience was I kept seeing that world. There kept being all those different worlds. Did you notice? Mm -hmm. There was a round globe, there was a map, there was another map, there was a globe. So Pam, what's your, what did you get out of this message? What did you notice about it? Yeah, well, I, I, looking for target audience clues, I was all over the place. At first I thought it was for a youth uh, market because of the simplicity and the graphic use and sort of the fast paced um, narration. Um, and, and then I kept seeing surprising things like uh, there was a headline about the European Union and then there was stuff about, you know, the economic thing. And I thought, gee, well, so maybe it's not for kids, you know, maybe it's for a wider audience. So, um, you know, it wasn't until we got to the end and I saw that it was a government, um, product that I, I now think it was probably for a wide audience. Yeah. And it was making it as just simple as possible as an introductory, here's what you need to look out for. What I really appreciate about the way you explained that was for many of the critical questions for analyzing media, we have to make inferences. You know, we have to make educated guesses. We don't always know, right? Like the, the nobody ever says, okay, here's a target audience or yeah. this is my purpose right? You have to put together the clues to figure it out. And so it's really a matter of what clues are you noticing? Okay, so I think that is a really key insight here. I wanted to just point you to the uh, Share America website because you get a lot of information by researching the author. And so uh, I just typed in Share America into Google, and I found out that Share America is the U.S. State Department's platform for sharing compelling stories and images that spark discussion and debate on important topics like democracy, freedom of expression, innovation, entrepreneurship, education, and the role of civil society, it's part of the Bureau of International Information Programs, which works with U.S. embassies and consulates in more than 140 countries to engage with people around the globe on U.S. foreign policy and America society. When you go to the homepage, you see a whole bunch of stories on all kinds of interesting topics right? All kinds of interesting topics. But now you must understand that the video that I just shared with you is itself a form of propaganda. How so? The video that I just shared you, it, it certainly was informational, but Based on what we know about propaganda, it was also propaganda. How so? Because it was trying to convince us of like fake news and what to look out for. Yeah, okay. It definitely, definitely had an intent and a point of view. Okay, so how, how is this propaganda? Why is this propaganda? It was intentionally designed to do what? To whom? to influence who and why? It 
so, oh, go, yeah, Jess? To influence a mass audience. So the State Department is delivering these me media messages to people around the world in 163 countries through the embassies who are um, trying to promote a positive image of America. In what ways does this video that we just saw promote a positive image of America? I feel like by warning the viewer of fake news, it's like, making the viewer assume that America itself does not participate in fake news, but it does. Well, it, it's definitely communicating this idea that we trust users to be empowered to figure it out, right? First of all, it says it's, uh, fake news is not a new, disinformation is not a new thing. It's been around for a long time. Second of all, you are powerful enough to deal with it right it does it positions you as capable of uh identifying satire looking for facts right but if you think about it uh in other countries the approach to disinformation is to uh, remove it so that you never see it right that's what they do in china <laughs> right <laughs> they don't trust their citizens to handle propaganda so they just they, they just supply their own government propaganda. This is propaganda, but it's a really interesting pro-democracy, pro-freedom of expression propaganda. And that's hard for us to see because we largely agree with it, right? So this kind of propaganda is hard to see because it actually aligns with some deep beliefs we have as Americans. Might be possible for a person in Germany or in Japan or in China or in Brazil to notice this as government propaganda, actually maybe more easily than we can, right? But only by drilling down to identify who's the author can we recognize, right? The government's interest in communicating to a global audience that like, we're not scared of our disinformation problem, right? There was no fear language like, oh my God, the world is ending. No, no, it was very calm, very professional. It's like, we're on top of it, right? It's not the end of the world that there's disinformation there and that a, builds confidence. There was also the piece of acknowledging that uh, the rest of the world exists, which a lot of people outside of the United States don't think that the United States knows. Great observation. I'm even, I'm even thinking, Pam, of the many images in the, um, oh, I think I got I, the wrong page here. Many images that, um, that featured the globe, yeah. right? And showing this as a kind of worldwide phenomenon. Yes, yeah. yes. So in some complicated ways, propaganda is, sometimes hard for us to spot. And that's partly brings me to a point I really wanted to underline for tonight's class. And this is a good time for me to bring it up because uh, your leap uh, ones are due in just a couple of days. I wanted to make a point about the relationship between critical analysis and knowledge, right? So asking those critical questions is terrific. But of course, it has to be paired with information seeking, right? So uh, asking critical questions plus seeking information, that's a good combination, right? If I hadn't gone to the Share America website, well, you know, I might not have noticed that who's the author at the end. You know, it, it happened so quickly, I, I might not have noticed. I might not have clicked on the uh, Share America icon at the YouTube channel, because that takes an extra step. But it was only when I gathered that additional information could I really understand the idea that the target audience was a global community within the context of, of public diplomacy. And now watching it over again, I'm gonna just turn the sound off. Just think about the several times, look at the globe. There's a globe, 
right? There's a globe. There's a uh, there's a there's a map. There's a European reference to the European Union, right? Um, there's more globes. There's more maps. So it gave me a much clearer sense of its purpose um, once I knew who the author was. So I just wanted to kind of underline that point. All right, I now I want to offer a little bit of great feedback on the work that you have um, been doing for me. My screen Best screen in show, uh, many of you did great work on the meme analysis activity and I could see that some of you were really having fun with it too, which is great. Um, but best in show was this team here, really loved uh, your insights, Nathan, Harrison, Rachel, uh, who else was on this team, uh, Tom. Um, this was the, uh, <laughs> this was the, I would say this is the Rodney Dangerfield meme. And you know, Pam, you and I, as the old ones in the room, I think we're the only ones who actually recognize <laughs> this guy as Rodney Dangerfield. Right? Rodney Dangerfield was a stand-up comedy uh, comedian from the 1950s, and he used joke, very, joke format very similar to the joke format that's here. So I thought this team's analysis of the meme was really great, wonderful work there. Uh, you guys are definitely starting um, to demonstrate some good critical analysis skills. Another thing that I was really pleased to see uh, this last week was how nicely you did in the um, PDF annotation activity. Wow, uh, almost as if you'd done it before, right? I was really uh, quite happy with uh, both of the articles that you annotated, and I uh, started to answer. You know how you had to you had to make two highlights, two comments and two questions, right? So I started to like comment on your comments and answer your questions <laughs> because I had so much fun sort of reading the sort of side sidebar discussions that were, oh, that were going on on, the, on these documents. I really got a feeling of the uh, thoughtfulness of your reading and of your applying these ideas to the contemporary scene. Um, so, um, yeah, so I was really quite pleased here um, to be able to participate in this discourse and add my own two cents on this topic and uh, see what a great job you did. So that was another highlight of, of the week for me. Um, clearly that was uh, evidence to me that you are gaining a lot of knowledge. I'll, I also was very impressed with the flip grids that you did this week on pick one of the um, 10 uh, criteria for critically analyzing propaganda, although you guys did uh, do a lot on context, target audience, and author, which does make sense in a way. Those are pretty important. Um, so, uh, this was also quite a pleasure, and you can see a couple of times when I thought your co your comments were really great, I, I responded to give you feedback. And this one is the one I want to share with you today, because I just thought this was so good. Taylor, what a great insight here. Is number yeah. Are you seeing that our screens are frozen? Oh, no. Yeah. What does that mean? Your screens are frozen. Does it mean you can see me or you can hear me or not? Just now, all I had, I was still on the Share America. Ah, oh, so can you sorry. See in the chat. Oh, thanks for letting me know. Now let me see. Can you see this image of Taylor now? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. I'm going to play you Taylor's. I'm not sure if this will work because it's really kind of using so much bandwidth, right? I'm playing a video from Flipgrid while I'm trying. I don't know if it'll work. We'll see. But I really love Taylor's uh, comment. I feel like it was one of the strongest ones in the collection. I want to make sure you guys get a chance to hear it. Although, I think that's, I was gonna do that, but I think I'm not gonna do that. So I do invite you to take a look at that. And uh, I commented on a few others that I thought were really strong as well. Um, all right, um, so I'm in general, pretty happy about the quality of work that you're doing, and I'm looking forward to your Leap Ones, which are due this Friday. Um, so, um, so 
so what's next here? Let's see here. What else do I want to talk about? Ah, has, has anybody played the bad news game besides me? Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what did you like or dislike or what did you notice about playing the bad news disinformation game? What did you like about it? Yeah, Hannah. Um, I, I kind of played it wrong at first. I was trying to not be kind of like the bad person and spread fake news. So then I had to redo it because I was like, what is this? You were losing. You were being so ethical. Yeah, it was really weird. And then it was like, you failed. I was like, oh, okay. Like I didn't, re I just kind of did it right away. So then after I did it, I, got, I think I got to like 9,000 followers. And then I like, but it was pretty cool. Like it was a kind of cool idea to kind of see and educate people in a different way. You know, I had the same experience when I first played it because I just felt so greasy doing some of those yeah. things. I just didn't want to do those things. And then it kept, you know, making me rethink that idea. Yeah. <laughs> And then, like you said, I just had that click, like, oh, okay, I get to, be the, I get to be the disinformation mm -hmm. spreader. Uh, yeah, so glad to, and glad to hear you, you got up to nine thousand. That's great. yeah. All right, other observations. What did you notice about playing the disinformation game? I think I had the opposite um, reaction. I was, uh, as I said in my um, report, uh, it was disturbingly easy for me to. <laughs> <laughs> become a propagandist of the worst kind. Yeah, I think it, I, I felt, especially at the end, by the time you get to the end, when it wants you to sh share a photoshopped, a fake photoshop, it wants you to be a fake uh, victim, right? The, the victim of the plane crash tragedy to pretend to be that person in a way you've become so desensitized exactly right that it's really easy and uh, for me what was interesting to notice was the way in which uh when you enrolled the troll or the bot army yeah. to spread your content then the mainstream media started to pay attention yeah right so we started to see disinformation sort of move from the margins into the mainstream uh, through the army of bots and trolls. Yeah. So one of the things I learned about this game was that it was created by a Dutch guy who calls himself an ethical hacker. Ooh. An ethical hacker. And it's his idea that maybe by playing this game, you could be inoculated from disinformation. He thinks that by getting to like become the propagandist through playing this game, that you have an awareness of those six techniques. And I, I wonder, do, do you guys remember any of those six techniques? What were, there were six techniques, six badges that you had to earn along the way while playing the bad news game. Do you remember any of them? Yeah, I added some of the icons in my blog. It was like impersonation, emotion, conspiracy, um, trolling. Yeah. Mm, uh, dis 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 deceit. Yeah. So clearly, stirring up emotion. Uh, that wasn't too hard. But you know what was the interesting one? The one that backfired, the conspiracy theory one, right? So when you first were presented with conspiracy theory, it wanted you to spread an outrageous, dumb conspiracy. I, I spread uh, cursive writing, I don't know, leads to right. something terrible, right? Yeah. And my followers all went away. Yeah. Right? And I was like, oh, because if you spread conspiracy theory that's too outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. You lose all your credibility, right? So, I don't know. Some people might argue that it's not a good idea to teach people how easy it is to spread disinformation. What do you think about that? I kind of, I kind of agree with that. I was like, what? You know what I mean? It is a good idea, but at the same time, I was like, geez, so many people. Like I said, my mom. Like so many people could fall for this, and just it is kind of weird. Or maybe think it would be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so that brings us to what we're talking about next week. So 
we are going to be reading a really interesting book called Trust Me, I'm Lying by Ryan Holiday. Uh, this guy is not an ethical hacker. Uh, this guy is a genius marketing guy, right? Who with very little money got a lot of attention using nine um, simple tricks. And in the first half of the book, he's going to introduce you to nine tricks for manipulating the information ecosystem from a marketing and a public relations point of view. Okay. So next week, our topic is sponsored content. And the best way to understand the topic of sponsored content is to um, hear from the point of view who people who create it for a living right so i want to talk a little bit about the uh, activities that i'd like you to do for next uh, week and um then we'll do a little longer term thinking right we'll think a little bit further down the road as you guys are probably already making plans for your spring break and all of that we want to get a sense of what's ahead so it's kind of like going from the frying pan into the fire to uh, week four, talk about disinformation, and week five to talk about sponsored content. But in some ways, we're simply just shifting our gaze from the political sphere to the commercial sphere, right? So many of the practices are the same in a different way, right? So. The question that we're asking this week is, how are changing business models affecting the rise of propaganda? So first activity, I guess I'm gonna maybe show it to you as if you were a learner, hold on, there we go. First activity, um, the first half of Ryan, how it's a breeze to read, okay? This is not, a, in, in no way is this a scholarly book. Right? Uh, we'll, watch, we'll watch the trailer that the publisher produced to give you that a sense of it. The internet is full of liars, cheats, and shit. And water will be anything. Your attention, page views, and publicity can control what you think. Your stories on the internet are your thoughts on you. The system is completely defenseless. Manipulators like me spread lies and generate fake outrage. We're interested in media manipulation. Here's one way. Start small. Send your story to a tiny personal blog from an alias email. They get an exclusive. You get an outlet. You then take that exclusive link and send another fake email to an even larger site. Like links in a chain, you move your story along to larger and larger sites. The original idea of building a your story becomes the story. This information is dangerous. It's up to you. My name is Ryan Holiday. Trust me, I'm lying. Okay, now it's important to note that Trust Me, I'm Lying was written a long, long time ago, way before anybody started thinking about fake news the book was published in 2012 and how old were you then you were in middle school right it was um the year that coney 2012 went viral becoming the most watched video of all time in just seven days reaching 100 million viewers at that time we were all very enthusiastic about the possibilities of the internet. And so Ryan Holiday at, in 2012 seemed like a bit of a downer. <laughs> but some people would say, well, he was just ahead of his time. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the first half of the book. Easy to read. After that, I want you to compose a blog post that identifies the three most interesting or novel tricks that he describes. He describes nine different tri tricks but which ones grab you the most? And then see if you can offer an example 
of how you have experienced or encountered one of these tricks in your own experience as a media a consumer. And if you like, you can comment on your perceptions of the ethical dimensions of these practices that Ryan Holiday is using. So that goes up on your blog post, just the same way that the Bad News Game did. But this is a really good way to start our conversation rolling. That activity is worth 10 points. Hey, oh, by the way, um, some of you have commented to me about how did you notice that every week you have more than 20 points worth of activities? You only need 20 points of activities to get an A for this class. I've given you a lot more choices because I'm yeah, trying to keep the class interesting for you and allow you to choose the activities that are most meaningful to you. So 20 points of class participation each week gets you an A in this class. And so you can make some choices here in what you want to do. Here's another choice, view and annotate. Watch the 11 minute native advertising segment from John Oliver's HBO series last week tonight and use the video ant annotation tool to make three comments on the video. So give me a thumbs up if you've used the video ant annotation tool before. Maybe not. Okay, so it looks something like this. Before you can make a comment, you have to log in to the video ant annotation tool using your Google account. And once you're logged in, you'll see the comment button. If you get stuck or anything, I put some tutorials there, but I'll show you what it looks like because I'm kind of logged in. Uh, oops, no, I'm not logged in. So I'm logged in and all I can do right now is play the video. Let's talk about corporate influence in the media. And before I do, I am very aware we're extremely lucky here on HBO. We don't okay, I got I want to comment that he's gonna be talking about his his the parent company, HBO. I'm gonna log in to this cool platform with my Google account, of which I have several. And I guess I have to give permission. How do I do that? Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Uh -huh. Our screens are frozen again. Oh, that's so terrible. Okay, hold on here. I'll try to come back here. How about now? Can you yeah. see it now? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm 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 um logging into the video ant and now I see this button right here. This button allows me to make a comment. So let's do it again. Let's talk about corporate influence in the media. Before I do, I am very aware we're extremely lucky here on HBO. We don't have advertisers. So if I want to say that, for instance, Capri cream eggs are filled with dolphin sperm. Ooh. Okay, so I'm gonna make a comment here. I hit this button here that's like the make a comment button and HBO doesn't use advertising. So he's not, in, he says, he's not influenced by corporate pressure the same way that other kinds of commercial media are. So what happens is I now see the two comments are showing up here in the margins. I can also respond to a comment, edit a comment, or delete a comment, right? And if you want to, you can also use closed captioning to read the captions, you know, the subtitles, if you have trouble with his crazy British accent, right? So video annotation is a really cool tool that creates an opportunity to talk about video while you watch it, right? Because, uh, for example, as I watch this video now, the comments are gonna kind of pop up Let's talk about as I watch. In the media. Before I do, I am very aware, we're extremely lucky here on HBO, we don't have advertisers. So if I want to say that- Okay. So you got the concept of how that works. That's, I think that should be a fun activity for you. Um, it turns out that in 11 minutes, uh, John Oliver takes you to graduate school practically. 
uh, with his in-depth analysis of the complex political and economic context of native advertising. So I know you're going to like that. I have another read and annotation uh, activity for you for a really interesting, very short article called um, mm, News You Don't Believe. I think that's what this is called. Uh, this is a really interesting report. Uh, it's a summary from the Reuters Journalism Institute. Where is it? It's still loading. It's still loading. Okay, so I will go back. Um, it's called Audience Perspectives on Fake News. And that's really useful to, for us to think about, like, what is the public understanding of this, of the issues of propaganda that exists in news and in um, society? The next activity. Mm, there we go. Ah, this one blew my mind. And since we are gonna be talking um, about sponsored content, this was an incredible article. Um, Rising Instagram stars are posting fake sponsored content. This is an article from the Atlantic Magazine about people who want other people to think that they have, that they ha that they have become influencers. So they pretend, <laughs> They pretend that a company has given them money to do something and they create a social media post that looks like they've been selected to be an influencer by a corporate, by a company, but they're really just pretending. And so um, basically the question is, um influencer marketing is on the rise is the strategy of fake it until you make it likely to be effective why or why not what might be the long-term social consequences of people composing media messages that are pretending pretending to be sponsored oh my god yeah you're gonna have a field day with that trust me Okay, next week we have a special guest, Samantha Stanley. She is a PhD student at the University of Hong Kong, and she's going to, I don't know, stay up late or wake up early. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. She's going to join us for class next week, uh, next uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. She's writing her PhD dissertation on the topic of propaganda and more specifically on sponsored content in the New York Times. She spent uh, 10 years of her uh, young career as a, a marketing and public relations a person. And so she's kind of an example of somebody who's in both academia and in the business community. I think you're gonna get a kick out of her. She's really terrific. So she's gonna give us something important. Now, I'm giving a little bit longer horizon here by putting on your radar screen the midterm examination coming up. You'll have only a little more than 48 hours to complete the online midterm examination, which will open on Thursday at 9 a.m. and close on Friday, March 1st at midnight. The online examination measures your understanding of the most important concepts and ideas you've encountered in the class. It's an open book, open note examination and you are expected to consult and use course resources in giving brief but substantive responses to open-ended questions. It, the exam will take about an hour and 15 minutes to complete. It's worth 150 points or 15% of your course grade. Uh, you will sign an honor code agreement before taking the exam, agreeing to uphold the principles of honesty, forthrightly oppose actions which would violate these ideals, all the work you produce for the midterm examination is expected to be your own. So what questions do you have about this work that's due next week and then a little further out? I know that we had kind of talked about this before and I know it must be somewhere, but on the blurbs I'm reading on Pathright about the LEAP assignment that's due, it doesn't really give a word count. Um, how, did you say that how long it had to be? 
I think at some point I suggested that it was going to be about 1,500 words. Okay. I think I suggested that it would be about 1,500 words. So that's uh, 250 words page. That's five pages. Okay. So, so it's not just a little throwaway blog post. Steph. That's right. one thing to think about. Uh, let's see here. But, but um, truthfully, um, shorter is better than longer. I'm a media person, right? Shorter is better than longer. But no, I don't think there is a minimum or a maximum. Really, it's looking right there. That's how I'm grading, not on how long it is. I'm gonna, myself those, I'm gonna ask myself those four questions. If, I, if I'm an enthusiastic yes about all four of those, then whew, you're good. I'm glad you asked that question. What other questions do you have? Um, I will for the midterm. Um, is it mostly like multiple choice, short answers? It's all short answers. All short answer. Do you know how many there is? Could you give us that? Uh, nope, I can't tell you that. Okay. But um, yeah, not too many. Okay. Not too many. So it's only going to take about an hour and a half mm -hmm. for you to move through this set of questions. So I wanted to let you know a little bit ahead of time so that you can start thinking about like, well, how do you best prepare mm -hmm. for a midterm and what strategies are going to be useful for you in uh, making sure you are prepared for the exam, given that it's a 48 hour window, mm -hmm. sort of thinking about where's your hour or hour and a half in that 48 hour window to do the, to do the work. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to best prepare for um, the exam yourself? Because I know that each week kind of students are picking what articles they want to read and what they want to focus on. So if people are kind of focusing on different things and they might be more prepared on different topics, do you just have any tips? Yeah, on great question. Great question, Jessica. You know, I, uh, students have told me different things. And so I'll just share with you what other students have suggested. One thing is each week is framed by a question. Hmm. <laughs> I would suggest that if you had answers to, to those questions, that would be really good. Then, so you can't just, to answer an exam question, you just can't offer an opinion. No, you have to defend that opinion with evidence. And it's an open book, open note exam. So I'm expecting that if you're gonna make a claim and answering the question, blah, 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 that you're gonna be able to pull up a piece of evidence, you know, and quote from it and use it. So some students have said to me that it's useful for them to be able to think about which ideas from which articles or videos align with their ideas because not like you said not everybody has read this exact same thing so i'm not expecting that these answers that your answers all be the same or that uh there's only one right way to answer these questions but i am looking at the relationship between your 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 reasoning and your use of evidence so maybe a chart or a plan that allows you to think about what your answers are to those questions and what evidence you might use, that would be cool. And then the third thing that, uh, so first thing, look at those questions, be prepared to answer those questions. Second thing, think about the evidence for those questions. And then the third thing students have told me is talking over those questions with a partner is a really good way to solidify what you think you feel confident saying that you've learned. Because this isn't the kind of thing where you can cut and paste. Uh, you have to kind of be able to, you know, just type it out. So some people have told me that they, that if they have a study buddy, that that process of like talking through um, what they've gotten out of the readings or what they've gotten out of the theme for the week can be helpful. So we'll be able to, through the platform that the exam is taken on, 
be able to like go back to the online articles that you've linked. Correct. So you'll be taking the exam on the path, right? And mm -hmm. since that's just one window, right? You'll be able to open up other windows and have all your materials available. Okay. Good questions. Thanks, Jess. Yep. What other questions do you have? Okay, so allow me to, since we are kind of looking ahead, you know, to spring break and then beyond. I want to tonight introduce you to Leap 2 because some of you have already completed Leap 1. I'm seeing from the Twitter sphere that uh, there's a bunch of Leap 1s up there for me to read. I'm looking forward to that. And the rest of you are going to be finishing Leap 1 very shortly, just in the next couple of days. So let's take a look at Leap 2 just to get a sense of where we're going. It's not due for a while. But it's, it's coming along, right? It's due in about uh, just about one month. So let's go take a look at it. Do that, I'm gonna go back to the um, propaganda page. There we are. And I'm gonna hit this assignments button. And sooner or later, this will show up on the path, right? But it's showing up for you now because I'm previewing it, right? You can see that it is due a long time from now, March 29th. It's called Collaborative Inquiry on Propaganda. Here's the overview. Working with a partner, you compare and contrast two specific examples of propaganda from two different time periods or two different cultures. To develop your ideas, you create both an academic essay and an infographic, both of which are embedded in a blog post. The purpose of this project is to give you an opportunity to demonstrate the knowledge and critical thinking skills that you're developing in this course while advancing your creative and collaborative skills. I want to underline that point a little bit and talk about it. It turns out my students get great jobs and have great careers. You know why? Because I insist that they develop not just their critical thinking skills and their academic writing skills, but also their creative and collaborative skills. And in this project, you're going to partner with somebody in this class to collaborate on a project. Step one, you have to find a partner. So there's a lot of creative and talented people in this class, as you have already discovered from reading people's comments in the margins. You can use this Google Doc to identify your interests for Leap 3 and find a partner, right? So that Google Doc simply takes you to a page that has all of your emails, and a place for you to identify a topic that you're interested in and, uh, and your name, right? Maybe you'll say, I want to do something on people for the ethical treatment of animals, <laughs> right? I'm a PETA fan, right? And see if there's anybody else in this class who's interested in the ethical treatment of animals. And that becomes the topic. So since every creative team develops a way of working together that harnesses the unique talents of each individual, you might want to listen to this five-minute radio segment called The Power of Two, because in this case, it's a collaborative project that involves you both figuring out something together, right? So you and your partner need to work out a plan for how to unleash your creative collaboration. You're going to be doing a, something called compare and contrast, which is just a powerful tool for learning and for life. I've provided you with a um, link to a great uh, resource on how to write a comparison contrast paper and how to do a comparison contrast analysis. This is a really great resource that comes from the Writing Center at the University of North Carolina. And if you haven't written a comparison contrast paper before, this is gonna show you how to do it step-by-step step, and it's superb and powerful and super useful for this 
writing assignment, right? Okay, so now then once you understand what is a comparison contrast, you've got to find two examples of propaganda. For brainstorming, you and your partner will figure out the content, the topic, and the issue, and then you're going to start searching around for materials because you're going to pick two artifacts from two different countries or from two different time periods. I've got some great places for you to search for propaganda. Oh my goodness, there's so many interesting places to search for propaganda. Of course, you can go to Mind Over Media to see some global propaganda or ads of the world or Nazi propaganda or the art of war or the National Archives or ads from the 20th century or the, pro or, or the way, you've got lots of resources to poke around and explore and search and find cool stuff, right? Um, then you're going to start to do some research and you're going to start to do some writing in the comparison contrast format. Obviously, I'm going to expect that you make connections to the course, right? Because you should be able to apply some of the knowledge from the course. You're going to write this as a Google Doc so that I can make comments in the margin, right? And you're writing an academic paper with all the codes and conventions of an academic paper, right? You're doing it with a partner. And then the fun begins. You're going to use PictoChart to create a simple infographic using some aspect of your the ideas that you developed in your paper. Uh, and I've given you a bunch of resources to look at for doing that. I'm going to, as we go along, show you a little bit about how to do that too in the weeks to come. And then you'll put it all together on your blog. You'll post a uh, link to on, on your Twitter, and you'll conclude by completing a confidential survey to evaluate your own performance and the work of your partner. Students who have done this activity say it's a blast. I've given you some examples of other students' work to look at, which should inspire you. But your initial reaction is going to be, holy shit, right? Okay, so let's just do a little temp temperature testing. Uh, put up fingers to represent how freaked out you are by leap two. Five fingers means you're completely terrified, and one means like, no problem, this is easy. <laughs> All right, that's cool. So take comfort in the fact that this is a project that requires power of two right the only way this project gets done is by harnessing two brilliant people working creatively together and i think over and over we see how much miracles happen when we do that so i'm going to be t so so this planting leap two for you this early it's it's not due for another month a little longer than a month right gives you a chance to just let yourself think about it for a little while, right? So you don't need to rush into this project right this minute, but I wanted to make sure it was on your event horizon because you'll be thinking about it and dreaming about it in the days to come and you might come up with some cool ideas. Okay, if you have questions about Leap2, I'm happy to answer them on the Twitter or on the email, or even on my phone. You've got my cell phone number too, right? I'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. We're gonna be talking about sponsored content and uh, corporate PR. We're gonna learn the nine tricks of the professionals, and we're gonna hear from a professional herself. So I'll look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Thanks for joining me tonight, all right? Good night. <laughs>